side of the story. Uh, we suppose there will be. We don't want her to be, but uh, it looks like that uh, it's the only way we're going to get a contract is to make the dealers realize that we've got to know what we're going to get each month. They're holding, well, they, uh, they don't want to give us a guarantee for the price per hundred per, for our milk. That seems to be the problem. Do you really think this is going to work? We hope it will. If, if, if it don't, why, we might as well quit and be done. We're, we're through if it don't work. That's the way we feel about it. This is my first combat assignment, and the Marines never hit a beach with more determination. Police estimate the invading force from the north at 30,000. Looks like that many in three blocks, so it could be a conservative figure. Now, this is the heart of the combat zone, the famous intersection of Las Olas and South Atlantic Boulevards. This is where the action is. Enemy forces are suffering losses in the South. Every available police officer has been called to active duty. All Easter vacations have been canceled in an effort to keep the northern invaders under control. It was touch and go for a while. 30 arrests resulted from the Good Friday rioting. It's a frenzied, frantic scene. Road walkers, hitchhikers, porch sitters, beer drinkers, male girl watchers, and female boy watchers. The transportation is tough. Car rental agencies, even number one, have run out of cars to rent. And number two has nothing with which to try harder. Here on the beach, top-down convertibles rank first, then two-ton buses that sleep 22, and tandem scooters for those who don't sleep. It isn't always easy getting the troops to talk. Somehow you get the feeling that perhaps there's been a breakdown in communication. There's fear that the commander might know you're AWOL, especially if you've told the commander back home that you're visiting with a roommate in Kankakee for the Easter weekend. In response to a question from a reporter about why students visit Fort Lauderdale, the invader replied simply, like man up north, that's where the parents and teachers are. And like man, in a week, that's where the post-vacation confrontation will take place. But between now and then, the campaign, and a spirited campaign it is, continues. The push, the squeeze, from the elbow room to the beach and back. Many women who gave up active professional careers to marry and raise a family are learning today that they can pick up where they left off years ago, particularly in the field of nursing where the need is greater than ever before. Here at St. Clair Hospital, a 30-bed unit is empty because there are no nurses available to staff it. It's to these ably trained professional women who need only to be brought up to date that the Hospital Council of Western Pennsylvania is sending out an urgent plea to come back to work. To make the transition from the inactive to active list as easy as possible, the Council, with the support of the Pittsburgh Board of Public Education, has created a special six-week refresher program designed to qualify an inactive registered nurse for active duty in local hospitals. The course will be provided at no charge and is scheduled to begin on April 10th. A typical example of a woman who left the nursing profession and then returned is Mrs. Marilyn Ramsey, who came back to nursing after a 15-year absence. Mrs. Ramsey is married, mother of two daughters. She returned to St. Clair Hospital as a staff nurse and has since been promoted to head nurse and her present position as supervisor of in-service education. Mrs. Ramsey, what made you decide to resume your career after such a lengthy absence? Uh, I think one of the main reasons was because my children were at an age where I felt I could leave them. And um, they just, I felt that I was wasting a career that I had spent time to educate, to become educated upon. So I started back after 15 years of being out. 
Well, let me ask you, was it a difficult adjustment coming back? Did you feel sort of out of it for a while? Yes, I certainly did. I think really it, it took me six months to really feel that I was back and in the swing of nursing and had my old security as a nurse back again. What was your husband's reaction? Oh, he was quite happy. I think he was pleased to think that I could go out and work again and make a success of myself. Mm -hmm. And what about your children? They were really happy. They liked to see mother get dressed up in a white uniform and go off to work every day. It didn't, uh, in fact, I think it made them more independent. They were always more dependent upon me and I found out that they really didn't need me as much as I thought they did. According to Thomas Callahan, the hospital council's executive director, there are literally hundreds of registered nurses in the area who are badly needed in local hospitals. And at the current level of nursing salaries, it will be more than worthwhile for them to consider resuming their career. As of January 1st of this year, nursing salaries have increased to $450 a month, the basic starting salary. They flew in for the funeral of Charles Wangaman, Jr., who was killed Friday when the Navy version of the TFX plane crashed near Calverton, New York, moments after taking off. A former resident of Mount Lebanon, Mr. Wangaman was graduated from the Naval Academy in 1960 and was a fighter pilot in Vietnam stationed aboard the aircraft carrier Coral Sea. He was shot down over northern Vietnam. He had been awarded the Navy Air Medal, the Commendation Medal, and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Mr. Wangaman became a civilian test pilot for the Grumman Corporation after being given a hardship discharge from the Navy last September because of the serious illness of his youngest son. He was at the controls of the test model F-111B when it crashed. This is the controversial TFX jet fighter. With me now is Lieutenant George Berg, a Navy test pilot who flew into Pittsburgh for Mr. Wangaman's funeral. Lieutenant Berg, have you had any experience yourself with the F-111B? Uh, yes, uh, just uh, this past uh, few weeks I've been uh, flying the F-111B uh, at the uh, Grumman Corporation plant in Calverton, Long Island. Were you there the day of the accident? Uh, no, I had uh, left the day before the accident occurred. Now, in your opinion, will this accident have any bearing on the future testing of this particular plane? Well, certainly uh, the testing will be delayed here uh, pending uh, the results of the investigation. And uh, this will, loss of this particular airplane will, will definitely uh, affect the test program. Uh, I imagine it uh, may delay uh, uh, testing and uh, certainly slow up the pro program. We've read a great deal about the controversy that surrounds the TFX jet fighter. What has the plane been designed to accomplish ultimately? Well, it's uh, uh, in the Navy version. It's uh, primarily a uh, interceptor, uh, as such, uh, for defense of the carrier, and is uh, being evaluated in that regard. I Bob, you've entertained the troops during three wars. Did you notice any difference in the attitude of the boys in Vietnam? Well, I think so, because this is a very uh, hot conflict, and whenever you uh, run into troops at the front, the, the spirit is very high and the morale is very high because they're really fighting for their lives. So you would say that morale is generally good? I think it's very, very good. And uh, I know all, our, all of our commanders over there told me voluntarily that these are the best fighting men they've ever commanded. This came out of uh, uh, three or four units over there. Bob, how do you feel when you come back from the combat zone and you come back to this country and you run into the Vietniks and the draft card burners? Well, I think that you have to expect that. In fact, 
the uh, ironic part of it is that we're fighting for the right to dissent, and those kids over there are smart enough to know it. I just think that General Westmoreland's appearance did a great lot to uh, sort of inform people of what we're doing and uh, what we're trying to do, and uh, they're doing a great job. I'm very proud of everybody I met over there. Interest in the boys' club. Right. Well, I've known Bing, you know, and he's started the whole thing. Speaking of your buddy, wouldn't you like to have an interest in his ball club about now? Yeah, they look pretty good. My team, my Cleveland team, is getting a slow start, but they, that may be a good omen because you know, they, they usually start very good, then they take a nosedive around July. This may work out better. They may just go on. They can't go anywhere. Uh, I'll be right there. Some fans want their money back. Uh, they can't go anywhere, but right straight up from here. Now, I'm interested in learning about the new religion that you formed. It's the League for Spiritual Discovery. Now, you use terms such as turn on, tune in, and drop out. Yes, the motto of our new religion is turn on, tune in, drop out. This may sound strange to you, but actually, this is the oldest message that religious teachers have been passing on to their fellow men for thousands of years. By turn on, we mean you've got to detach yourself from the fake television studio that you call American society or Roman society or Athenian society. You've got to find the divinity within. And once you do that, you have to come back and tune it in. You have to glorify. You have to make love, make beauty instead of make war and making money. And you have to drop out. You have to drop out. I'm sorry. You have to detach yourself from American society, which is run by menopausal minds, aging men who are concerned with war warfare and power, and the younger generation just can't buy this suicidal and dangerous system. They've got to drop out. You must realize that the 10 million Americans, 10 million who are using marijuana, and the two or three million Americans who are using LSD, we're not dope addicts, we're not criminals, uh, we're serious people. As a matter of fact, we're your most intelligent, we're your most creative people. And uh, we do pose a threat to certain aspects of American society, but the threat we pose is the ancient threat of a new generation, a new religion. What we're seeing in the United States today, and throughout the world for that matter, is a new revolution in consciousness. After all these millions of years, man is finally waking up to the fact that what's really important is not what's out there, not how many cars you have in your garage, or not even the television set that you're looking at right now, nor the money in the bank. What's important is what's within. And we now have new powerful chemicals like LSD, which are microscopes, which can open up a reality and accelerate consciousness. And from now on, it's not so important what's out there as what you can discover within. That's the new revolution in consciousness. Uh, by and large, personally, I felt Dr. Larry was a fraud. I, uh, again, was not very impressed with him or with his message. Do you feel that his cult is a threat to conventional morality? No. Uh, as I understand it, his, his open advocacy of, of drug taking and uh, uh, the consumption of marijuana and LSD, I think if you're oriented toward this idea, fine. Most people are not. Most people, I feel, are frightened of it. Uh, they're frightened enough of it, uh, enough by it, to stay away from it. Uh, what Larry has to say is, is interesting, it's contemporary, but it's still dangerous. And most people approach it just like this. It is dangerous. 
Well, he, he says that um, LSD and marijuana is used widely among the better colleges in the country. What's the situation here at Duquesne? Well, um, without casting aspersions on my college, I would have to say that the LSD, LSD takers and the pot smokers in a distinct minority, rather than looking for a mystical experience, I think most of us are looking for jobs, and uh, it makes it uh, a little bit difficult to uh, go out on a trip for a religious experience and go out on a trip on the 7754 to look for uh, summer labor. Uh, do you think with all of the publicity that the riots have uh, received this year, do you think you'll be allowed to come back next year? Oh, I think so. I mean, really, it's not that bad. The kids are just having a good time. And if they're stupid enough to get thrown in jail, that's their fault. They had riots before. <laughs> George, as the photographer assigned to this trip into the Amazon, what are some of the problems that you anticipate in shooting film in 120 degree temperatures and extreme humidity? Well, the first problem is the extreme heat and the humidity is very dangerous to color film. So we're ordering the film in tropical packs and we have special arrangements made for the base camp to have refrigeration to keep the film cold and I have uh, styrofoam packages and insulated bags that carry the film in. And uh, the only film that will be exposed to the tropics will be the actual roll that's in the camera, and that will only be for the time that it's in the camera. As soon as it's shot, it will be put right back into an insulated bag and then returned to the refrigeration uh, area that same evening. Now, you're also going to be doing some underwater photography, we understand, and you'll be shipping this film back approximately uh, several times a week. How do you go about uh, getting the film back to us here? Well, Mr. Koshu, who is in charge of the expedition, has said that he will make arrangements to fly the film from Leticia, which is right down on the equator, 250 miles south of the equator, and uh, in a pretty lonely spot as far as transportation is concerned. But he will fly the film to an, a more modern city where commercial airliners will bring it back to Pittsburgh and we hope to have several segments to bring to send back ahead of us so that we can keep the people in Pittsburgh uh, appraised of our progress and what's going on down there. Are you concerned about mobility and filming some of this uh, excitement? Well the the camera that I'm going to use primarily is a Bolex, a 16 millimeter Bolex. It's a hand camera and one that I can carry uh, right with the safari, be out on the dugout canoes, or move up and down the banks of the river, climb a tree if I have to, and still keep the camera with me and be shooting or ready to shoot at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, George, we know from experience that sometimes uh, cameras will require some instant repair work. Now, there's not going to be a repair shop close by. What are you going to do if your camera presents some problems? Well, I've thought about that, and I'm taking two cam well I'll actually have three cameras but I'll have two Bolex cameras with me one as a spare in case the other one has any mechanical difficulty and then my uh, Cine Kodak is the one that I use in my underwater filming but I could also adapt that to topside photography if uh, it was necessary.
John, this trip into the Amazon as a working assignment, is it one that you volunteered for without a minute's hesitation? No, I was, uh, I was offered the opportunity. I thought it over uh, one evening. I asked my wife about it, and uh, she would have liked to make the trip herself, and uh, she urged me to go ahead. And uh, it's very appealing. Well, John, this trip into the Amazon is a working assignment for you. Did you volunteer without a minute's hesitation? Well, I know the, uh, the, the uh, publisher of the Post-Gazette asked me if I would like to go. I thought it over for one evening, talked about it with my wife, and uh, she was quite enthusiastic about it. She knew she couldn't go, so she was agreeable that I would go. I imagine that you've done as much research as you could in the uh, country and the environment. Now, I know that the, there are strange parasites that we certainly don't have in, in this country. Are you apprehensive at all about some of the, some of the bugs and uh, some of the problems that you will face? Somewhat, uh, to be frank, uh, the only thing that's encouraging is that everyone that goes there seems to return quite all right. Uh, they all seem very casual about it, so I can't get too concerned or uh, apprehensive. Mm -hmm. I imagine from a writer's point of view there is uh, some appeal just from the fact that this is perhaps one of the few remote points left in the world. Uh, this is perhaps uh, an area where uh, you'll find that things have not changed uh, to any large extent. Do you uh, look forward to this trip with, uh, with great anticipation? Oh, definitely. I think uh, South America, even uh, it had been in the past that Africa was a place where you could see many strange things or things which had not been too much affected by civilization. But uh, South America, because of the climate and uh, other factors, a uh, large area of it there in the Amazon Valley is unsettled. Uh, people are doing a number of people are doing what they have been doing for a hundred years or more, and it, it, it hasn't appealed to anyone who's living in the 20th century. Thank you, John. Lee uh, would have the um, feeling of all of the American people at heart and I think that's what a man needs to be president of this country. He has to have a, a feel for all of the people. Thank you. Quite welcome. Thank you. Of the civil rights and church groups who are going to picket his visiting. Well, I happened to see uh, Governor Wallace on television last night and he says it's a free country. I agree with him. Let him pick it. Let him make all the speeches he wants and let them pick it all he wants. Do you think he'd make a good third party candidate for president? Well, I wouldn't feel qualified to answer that uh, sincerely, but I say this, if he's elected, I'll go along with him. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Right. Okay, I just want to like? ask you a question. I want to ask you a question, that's all. Okay. Uh, what are your feelings about George Wallace coming to Pittsburgh to speak tomorrow? Oh, goodness gracious. Well, I, I really I don't think too much about it. I don't especially like him. He seems to be kind of a person that flaunts, uh, seems to make roles to suit himself, and I don't especially like the idea that he's coming here as a guest. I don't. Uh, All right, what is it? Okay, look at the camera. Sir, there's a great deal of controversy surrounding George Wallace's visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow. What are your feelings? What are your feelings about George Wallace's visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow? That's pretty hard to say. God bless him, I hope he can be turned out all right. But I don't know. It's a free country. He should be able to come over if he wants. That's the way I feel. Fine. Thank you.
Sir, you know, there's a great deal of talk about George Wallace's scheduled visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow. What are your feelings? I don't know. Well, I don't know. I, would, uh, I don't mind. I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him. Well, well there's also a lot of talk about George Wallace for president. Well, I don't know. I just, I just say what I want. I'm amazing. Yeah. Well, do you uh, do you think that uh, the uh, visit should be uh, picketed and protested by the civil rights groups and the church groups? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Church groups. I mean the church. Two, the two churches, Protestant and Catholic. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I thank you, sir. A deal of uh, controversy about George Wallace's visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow. What are your feelings? Well, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, you think that uh, you should be allowed to come in and speak without any demonstrations or protests? No, I don't. Uh, a lot of people feel that he may announce his candidacy for president on a third party ticket. What are your feelings about that? No. <laughs> Do you feel that uh, Wallace would be qualified uh, to become president? No, I don't. Thank you. <laughs> you are. Question? You're in a hurry. What are your feelings about George Wallace's scheduled visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow? Well, uh, I don't know too much about it. I don't, I don't watch the news too much. Thank you. Uh, what are your feelings about George Wallace's scheduled visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow? Well, I'd rather he didn't. I, I just don't care very much for Wallace. Um, I know that uh, the NAACP has a right to protest. Do you think they should? Well, as, I mean, you can't stop the man from coming, but uh, that doesn't mean you have to like it. And since uh, the NAACP is against everything George Wallace stands for, I believe they do have a right to uh, picket his, um, well, his meeting or whatever he's going to have after he gets here. Do you think he's qualified as a presidential candidate? No. Thank you. Sir, what are your feelings about George Wallace's visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow? Well, I think he's got a right to come here. He's a citizen and he's a gentleman. And if he's invited here, I think it's proper to treat him uh, as anybody else should be treated. I don't think they should have any trouble about it. There's a drive underway in the city to make George Wallace president. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, he may be a good man for president. I don't know that. I'm for uh, Johnson, so that's the way I feel about politics. Fine. Thank you, sir. Okay. Sir, there's a lot of comment about George Wallace's visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow. What are your feelings? Well, I think George Wallace has a right to his opinion, though I don't agree with it. Uh, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of protest about it, to see that the American people uh, disfavor George's opinion. There's a drive underway to make George Wallace president. What are your feelings about that? <laughs> well, I regret that very much because I don't think Mr. Wallace is uh, a worthy man for candidacy for the presidency of the United States. Fine. Thank you, sir. Sir, well, how do you feel about George Wallace's scheduled visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow? Well, I've heard about him uh, coming, but uh, I don't uh, believe I'm going to spend any time trying to see him at all because I don't, uh, between him and his wife, I think they have something going that uh, I don't see why the public's putting up with it. They, uh, as far as him running for their presidential election, which there's been, I guess, gossip about it, uh, I don't think he'd have a chance because uh, I don't think he'd have any of the colored votes at all for the way he's been acting. And I just heard of a, 
Well, last night on television, some of our news broadcast that he uh, saying that things in Alabama weren't run like what's been uh, told to the public. But uh, I, that's about all I know. I don't know too much about him, but uh, I personally uh, wouldn't spend any time coming down here and speak. Thank you, sir. No. I'm sorry. Excuse me. You know, there's a lot of comment about George Wallace coming to Pittsburgh tomorrow. What are your feelings? I really don't know because I don't have any feelings about him, really. Because they say so much about him, I really couldn't say. Do you think the NAACP should protest his visit? Well, from his comments and what he says about him, I think they should. Yes. Do you think uh, George Wallace would make a good president? Not really, no. Thank you. What time? Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, George Wallace's visit to Pittsburgh tomorrow. What are your feelings? Hmm. I really haven't thought about it. I really haven't. Well, you know he's coming. Uh, yeah, I heard about it, but I haven't given the matter any thought. There's also a lot of talk about George Wallace uh, becoming a candidate for presidency on a third-party ticket. What are your feelings about that? I just haven't thought about it at all. Thank you, sir. Okay.